He is a former director general of Ikim and author of many books in Islamic philosophy. Uh, please welcome uh, Datuk Dr. Said Ali Taufik al -Attas. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Khalif. I'd like to thank also uh, Kasis for hosting this event. And I'm also very happy to see Professor Wan, Professor Alparslan, Professor Zaini, all our good friends at ISTAC. And one thing maybe perhaps I'll say thank you to Cassius for is for putting me after Professor Alparslan. I mean, how can I follow that? How can I follow Professor Wan and Professor Alparslan? It's very difficult, but it's our duty as far as we are concerned that we must, inshallah, um, participate in this event. And perhaps maybe since Professor Wan and Professor Alparslan started with reminiscences of their days at ISTAC, telling when they first met Professor Al, uh, Professor Al Attas and so on and so forth. Maybe I should also say the same thing. Well, I first met Professor Al Attas in 1965. No, no, I'm just kidding. No, um, it's one thing to be a student of Professor Al Attas, it's another thing to be his son. It's one thing to be learning about Islamic civilization, worldview of Islam, justice, existence, being, adab, hikmah, knowledge, corruption of knowledge, Islamization of knowledge. It's one thing to learn all these things, but it's something else to be actually living that tradition. And this, I think, is an important element as far as my upbringing is concerned, because I actually lived uh, this tradition. I'm still living this tradition. And I can remember as far back as when I was a young boy, when my father was writing, my father would typically write on this big A5 piece of paper with a pencil. And whenever he'd finish writing one page, he would call me up to his study, this room I'm sitting in now. And he would sit me down and he would read from what he had written. And from there, I'm talking about when maybe I was eight or nine years old. And from there, he would start explaining his ideas. And he would tell me that perhaps now you don't understand, but in future, inshallah, you will understand. Now, of course, it's true. But those pearls of wisdom when I was young, it impacted me in such a way that I still remember them and I still understand what he was trying to accomplish. And all his students who have come to visit him at, at this house when I was uh, here, I mean, I still remember all of them, all of them who have become quite sim significant members of the society, some of his more uh, uh, flamboyant, shall I say, students. And of course, Professor Wan, who is perhaps the best example of Professor Al Altas's uh, uh, scholarship influence on, on uh, on the, on the Muslims. <clears throat> Professor Alparslan has mentioned just now that it's very significant for a Muslim scholar to have a whole system. And that is true. And I remember one particular instance when we were at Istak before. I, I, Professor Alparslan was my teacher for one of my classes. And he said this to me, and it, and it has stuck with me till now. And I found it to be extremely helpful. At first, I didn't. At first, I thought it was just more work for me. This is what he said. Professor Alparslan said, if you really want to understand something, if you, under if you want to understand someone's writing, see if you can read the thing, the book, and try to summarize it in a paper, maybe a 15-page, 20-page paper. Having done that, you take that paper, and see if you can summarize it into a page. Having done that, see if you can summarize it into a paragraph. Having done that, see if you can summarize it into a sentence. And having done that, see if you can summarize it into one word. If you have done so successfully and truthfully and correctly, that shows that you have understood. Now, why I tell this story is this. People always ask me, <clears throat> by people I mean, 
students as well as students of my father. They'd always ask me, how would you classify Professor al work? What would you say that his work is? Uh, that's, that's, first of all, it's a very vague kind of question. Secondly, in order to summarize the entire scope of his work, you'd have to be quite knowledgeable on all the areas that he has written. Now, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on all of them with great humility in front of my Professor al Parstan and Professor Wan. I always say to them that if it was me and you are asking me, how would you classify in one word what is Professor al contribution and what was he trying to achieve? I would say justice. That, in a nutshell, summarizes the entire work of my father. All his attempts, all his endeavors were aimed at arriving at justice. In other words, he wanted to put things in the proper place in accordance with itself and in accordance with the system to which it belongs. This is quite important because a lot of people seem to ignore the, the second part of that uh, conceptual formula, i.e. when we say justice is, is, uh, is to put things in its proper place, we seem to forget the other part that says in accordance with itself and in accordance with uh, the system to which it belongs. Because then you would ask yourself, what is this system? And my father has already explained this very clearly in his magnum opus, the Prologomena, that this system is the worldview of Islam. And if you don't know the worldview of Islam, you are ignorant of the system, you are not going to be able to achieve real justice. But in trying to study these things, early on, my father was already very cognizant of the fact that the problem that plagued the Muslim world, and I mean, these were talking about the early 60s when he was still in McGill. He said that the problem is the problem of knowledge. This is the, 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 the biggest problem facing the Muslim, the problem of knowledge. And what is that problem? With the corruption of knowledge, with the westernization of knowledge, or with the, with the secularization of knowledge. And when he wrote and published that book, uh, Islam and Secularism, he was very clear in saying what uh, Islamization meant. Now, when some people read this book, they still think that there is something missing in the sense that he didn't define clearly to them, I suppose, how is, what is the beginning of this Islamization. Now, when I look at it myself, I look at it from the other side because he talks about secularization. What is secularization? And he says that secularization begins with language. Now, because he says secularization begins with language, we can also then say that Islamization, which is what my father is actually saying, Islamization begins with language. And this is why, like Professor Wan and Professor Alparslan said earlier, my father was very particular and still is very particular about language how to use this language correctly, in what context, what kind of words signify what how to define things very clearly. It's very, very important. And perhaps for this reason, um, when I, when I, uh, when I uh, became a member of ISTAC, he was emphasizing this a lot to me about language, that you must, you must be skillful in language and logic. He was very, very particular about that. You have to be able to think correctly because he already recognized, like a lot of the other Muslim, great Muslim thinkers before him, he already recognized the fact that language and thought are reflexive. And therefore, if your, if your language is incorrect, or if you don't use the correct use of language, then your thought is also going to be affected. If, for instance, you corrupt the language, then your thought will be corrupted. If, on the other hand, your language is true, and if it's correct and precise, then your thought will also be the same. And this is the, this is the most impactful thing if you are going to start learning about how he has constructed his concepts. You have to start with language and you have to be able to know the proper place of this language in this worldview. I think Professor Wan and Professor Alparsan will both agree with that. Now, there's another thing that perhaps needs to be said, I think. It's one thing to say that someone is a great scholar and someone has discovered this and discovered that. Yes, that is all true. 
But there's another element to that as well, and that is the rediscovery. And that is something that is extremely difficult to do. For someone like my father, he has rediscovered a lot of uh, things which had remained latent and which has not been brought to the surface for perhaps hundreds of years. And this is one of, his, one of the, the contributions that he has made in all of his writings. I mean, that prolegomena to the metaphysics of Islam, the, what we refer to as the magnum opus, is in fact, <clears throat> has in, when before it was published by Istak under that title, it has already been ever present in my father's mind the whole time since he started writing in the 60s or even in the 50s perhaps all of his work up till that point was uh, to try to explain gradually about the religion of islam and the worldview of islam about justice about the nature of man about adab about knowledge and it culminated in this uh, um, prolegomena to the metaphysics of islam so if we had said just now that justice is perhaps the central theme of his writings, I will also say that uh, what Professor al and Professor Wan had mentioned earlier about Ada is also another huge uh, concept and a huge uh, contribution towards justice, towards achieving this justice. And the fact that the Muslims have had this problem of loss of Ada and they've had this for so long, it bears testament to how he has again uh, uh, what do you call it? Formulated his ideas in these books that he has written. If we want to look at his contributions, we can't stop simply, like uh, Professor Wan and Professor Alpaslan are saying, we can't stop simply at the conceptual philosophy part. There also has to be a, pra a practical application. And as was correctly mentioned earlier by the two great scholars, that it is now up to us, the students of Professor Alatas, to try to put whatever he has uh, conceptualized and taught and practiced really into reality. But this takes, number one, it takes knowledge, which we are all striving for. But number two, and perhaps equally as important is courage. We need courage. This is something I think that a lot of people, I, I, don't, I don't want to say lack courage, but for lack of a better word, I have no other choice but to say that, that they sometimes lack a bit of courage to put forth certain things and to emphasize them and to forcefully try to defend them. I think this is extremely important now for us because we already know now, we have a roadmap. We've already been educated in such a way, we've already been, been uh, introduced to these conceptions we've already been uh, privy to the explanations and definitions of how they are explained and how are they going to be applied because that's another thing that that uh, my father has contributed in all of his writings and that is the the uh, uh, what do you call it what they say nisba or the, the knowledge of relations how one thing relates to another and you can see from all of his writings that there is always a nisbah of how one thing relates to another. It is never something that is abstract. It is never something that is floating by itself. It is never like that. It is always the knowledge of the relation between one thing and another. That's why one, one of his, one of his uh, recent publications on justice and the nature of man, which was out a few years ago, when my father was writing this book, I remember he was asking, he was asking me to help him with uh, how he wanted to explain the fact that man was insan, that he was not homo sapien. Now, I think this, this idea in the justice and nature of man is a revolutionary idea, revolutionary in the sense that this is the answer or rather the opposite to the theory of evolution, which has been holding sway for the past 200 over years. Now, Muslims on the one hand, we don't know, do we agree with this theory of evolution or do we not agree with it? Some people will say, well, we agree, although we are still Muslim, we, we believe in Allah, one and all this kind of stuff. But at the same time, we also agree with the evolutionary part of it. Now, if we understand the worldview of Islam, we cannot agree with this evolutionary idea. And this is why now, when my father's talking about this, 
uh, that that man is a is a, a special creation. Of, of course, he's taking these references from the Quran. Now, man as a special creature, he is not subsumed under the genus Homo, nor under the species Sapiens. This is a Western ideology. And now for the Muslims to try to think that we can force a, a so-called Islamic idea into the same framework is a big mistake. <clears throat> so we had this discussion, my father and I, about how on the one hand we understand that the Islamic conception is vastly different from the Western, I mean the uh, Judeo-Christian tradition, but on the other hand, how we cannot take this Islamic idea and try to force it into the mold, which is a Western mold, essentially. In other words, one that has been defined by people like Linnaeus, who have the, uh, the kingdoms, the, the order, the genus, the phylum, the, I mean, the phylum, the species, the, I mean, the genus, the species, that we don't agree with this, although it's a useful, uh, a useful uh, classification tool, but we don't agree with this. And this is what this, this, uh, this book on justice and the nature of man has tried to introduce that we are not a species. Uh, in other words, we are not belonging to any kind of genus that we ourselves are a, are a, are a, a, a new creation, a special creation. And that, and therefore we are, if we were to use the same kind of classification system, we are a kingdom of ourselves, a kingdom on our own. This kind of thing has never actually been been said since um, since the, the theory of evolution. This is already about 200 years old now. Nobody has ever said this except now. And yet, this is also the, the introduction to a curriculum or a new curriculum of education, like Professor Al-Faslam was talking about just now. What to teach when it comes to man or insan. And now we can see from this book uh, on, on justice and the nature of man that we now have an opportunity to create a new curriculum to teach uh, the nature of man in sciences, for instance, in the sciences. This is a new opportunity for us, and we should be grabbing this opportunity to, in other words, to develop a new curriculum. And that's not the only thing. I mean, on this... Uh, this idea of man being a special creation and that he is not part of a species or a genus. That's only one of the ideas introduced in that work. One of the other more, uh, one of the other also equally important ideas is the age of mankind. That one also is a very important uh, idea because otherwise we will be thinking that there is no beginning. If we are now thinking like a lot of the confused commentators, modern day commentators, I mean the modernists, who, who pretend that Adam himself is not really an individual, but a, a metaphor for mankind, then as my father rightly pointed out, and he has said this to me, in fact, he told me this last night, he said, if you, if you think that Adam does not exist, or that Adam just means mankind, Therefore, there is no beginning point, and therefore you can keep going further and further and further back, and then there's no end to it. But there has to be a, a beginning point, and that's the same with knowledge. If you want to, if you want to uh, gain knowledge, you have to begin somewhere at a beginning point. Now, when it comes to this, like the age of mankind, we have to start with Adam, as far as the Muslims are concerned. And when we start with Adam, in order to know how old is man what is our nature who are we and how that that knowledge relates to the worldview itself and relates to all the further the other conceptual philosophies it's an extremely important idea we have to understand when or how old we are i think that also has has a, a great opportunity for us now to start rewriting some of the elements of history because as another thing that my father likes to uh, emphasize, on the one hand, it, when it comes to knowledge, of course, is that there is that Vahir uh, element and the Batin element. Now, when it comes to history, my father always likes to, likes to uh, emphasize this point, that we are not really that concerned 
about the Dahir element as much as we are with, with the Batin element of history. But there's one other element that we, are, we don't seem to be uh, that much aware of, and that is the, the how-ness of history. It doesn't mean how something happened. What he means is how that history is written, because that, that is going to influence uh, knowledge, how history is written. And as you can see from our world today, sometimes our scholars are, are too, let's say, subcontinent centric. And is this correct or not? I think it is not correct. I think we need to really understand how this history has been written and try to, try to come to an understanding to correct it, to correct these mistakes. I don't want to take too much time. Already we have 20 minutes already. Anyway, I'm just so thankful and so happy, and I'm sure my father is as well, and he sends salams to all of you, and he's very grateful for all of you for having this uh, symposium. And I hope that it will be of benefit to the, the youth and the younger generation to come. I myself now, I mean, we still think of ourselves as, as young men, Professor Alpaslan, myself, Professor Wan, all of us, we have... We are young at heart, young in the mind, but gradually we, we, are, we also have to recognize that we are not getting younger. I mean, we know this, but our hopes are also in the next generation that comes after us. But we hope to be able to be a part of that small, uh, uplifting generation by imparting some wisdom, some knowledge to them so that they also may be able to prosper. It's very difficult, I know, especially with today's world. It's extremely difficult. There's a lot of, of, uh, of um, um, how, how do I say? There's a lot of uh, disillusionment. There's a lot of disappointment. And I mean, and there's a lot of injustice. My dear brothers and sisters, this injustice is, is unbelievable. Not just in Malaysia, in the world. But, we as Muslims, we should be more interested and more particular with what happens to our own brethren. And we are not doing justice by them. We are doing a great deal of injustice. And I hope that this kind of a colloquium will assist and will at least spurn people, the viewers, the, the, the audience, to try to come and, and, and study these works that my father has written, study the works that Professor Wan has done, study the works that Professor Alpaslan has written, study the books of myself, for instance, that, I, that I've done, Professor Zaini, my, and a lot of the former people, former students of Istak and professors of Istak, their works are invaluable. And I must say that for me also, that those years that we had at Istak with all the professors, they were some of perhaps the best years of my life. It was really a great learning experience, even though at the time, sometimes you didn't think it was, but as I said before, being the son is different from being just a student. You have to have special attention. And I use those in inverted commas. And Professor Alpaslan knows exactly what I mean by special attention. So it is a difficult time. I understand that. We have suffered a great injustice, but we need to be courageous. We need to stand. We need to stand for what's right. We need to say things that are, that are difficult to say, but need to be said if there is this corruption of knowledge, which is happening, I mean, it, it, like wildfire. It's ridiculous. People who are not uh, qualified to talk, they are given the platform. We should not allow this. We should, we should, we should reb, uh, rebel against that. We should allow the real scholars, the ones who really know, we should really go and seek out people like my father, who I can safely say he really does emulate what the Ulul Al-Bab really are. That's what he is, as far as I'm concerned, of course. And I'm, I'm privileged to be his son. I'm privileged to, to be his student as well. And I'm privileged to have such friends, friendship, and the great company of uh, Professor Wan, Professor Alpaslan, Professor Zaini, and uh, all the colleagues at, uh, at uh, ICLIF. So I think uh, maybe perhaps I should stop here now but i thank you all again and again on behalf of my father as well please our warmest salams and our prayers to you all for safe uh, uh and uh, safe and uh, 
uh, what do you call it? Happy life, inshallah. Thank you.